Hi, I'm Coach Corey Wayne, and this is my video coaching newsletter. And the topic of today's newsletter is going to be Negotiation 101, Trump and Healthcare. Well, obviously, for those of you that may be paying attention, there was a lot of stuff going on this past week with Donald Trump and his health care plan, which on Saturday, he basically pulled it and he walked away from the deal. So I thought it would be a great topic to discuss what is his negotiation strategy? Because if you listen to the people on TV, even members of his own party, especially people in the Democratic Party, they're all talking about what a huge, devastating loss it is. But obviously all these people that are chiming in don't really understand negotiations. So I thought I would be a great topic for a video to go through what is his strategy? What is he really doing? And if you've read his book, The Art of the Deal, and you listen to like what he's saying, what the Republicans in his own party are saying, that what the Democrats are saying, and what the pundits are saying, you can read between the lines and see how the things that I teach in my book and talk about all the time match up exactly with what he's actually doing in the real world. So I got a quote that I wrote in this topic, obviously, and then we're going to go through some bullet points that I wrote down because it's a really interesting topic because you're seeing a world-class businessman negotiate a deal in real time and obviously you got people chiming in that don't that aren't business savvy and they don't understand negotiation at all and it's really an interesting topic so the quote says when you can't get the deal that you want now and you're not willing to settle for less than you really want you must walk away and mean it if you are desperate to get a deal done the other parties will sense your weakness and you will lose any leverage you might have had by not being attached to your outcome and how you achieve it, you can walk away from a position of strength. The person who is least invested in making a deal now is always stronger, is always in the stronger negotiating position to get the deal they want later if they are willing to wait and hold out for what they really want. Sometimes you have to call the other person's bluff and let a deal die. When they become more desperate to get a deal done, they will come back and give you the terms you really want. When it comes to deal making and getting what you want, impatience will never command success. And for those of you that might be in a situation where you're trying to get an X back, this is what all of these principles are based upon, getting the terms that you want in your intimate relationships. But what's beautiful about learning this is that you can apply those same tactics in your career to get a raise, when you're interviewing with multiple employers to make sure you get the best deal and they actually start bidding against each other for the opportunity to have you come work for them and therefore you can get better terms and a better salary than you would have gotten otherwise. We're obviously gonna talk about leverage as well here and there was a, a tweet of Donald's that he tweeted out and this was on May 2nd of 2014 and it said this was on his Twitter feed negotiations 101 the best deals you can make are the ones you walk away from and then get them with better terms I think the art of the deal is a great book and for those of you I read this back and I think it was in college when I read that for the first time in the in the late 80s early 90s and I learned a lot from it and stuff that I learned years ago and applied in business when I started applying those in my personal life I was amazed at wow I'm actually getting better results even when it looks like when you let the woman walk away which interesting is after she's had a few days or a few weeks a few months sometimes even years to think about it they look back and they say you know maybe I shouldn't have done the things I did maybe I shouldn't have reacted the way I did maybe I overreacted and then she often comes back. And for those of you who've been following me for a while, I just read countless stories of them over the years in my video newsletters where guys are able to renegotiate the terms and they get a better deal for them and for their girl. And this reminds me, I may, I've talked about this in videos in the past, where when I was in real estate, when I first got into the foreclosure business, flipping foreclosure houses, a lot of times I would, I would really find a nice property that I really wanted to buy, but... The numbers just didn't work or they weren't that great. The bank wanted too much for the property. 
And I knew usually every 30 to 45 days, the realtor that was representing the bank would say, hey, it's not selling, let's reduce the price. And so what I would do is I, I had a file with, pro I mean, sometimes I had properties that I followed up on for like two years, a year and a half, two years before I was ever finally able to get a deal where the bank was willing to sell it at my terms. Even though I really wanted to buy the house because I saw what it could be when it was fixed up in like new condition, if the numbers don't work, they don't work. In your personal life, if you can't get the terms that you want, the worst thing you can do is to agree to worse terms. Like when you're getting friend zone, you say, okay, well, I'll be friends, even though it's not what I really want in hopes that she'll later give me what I want. You're not negotiating from a position of strength. You've actually given up all of your leverage and when you don't have any leverage and the woman doesn't respect you because she knows that you really want to date her romantically and you agree to being friends only even though that's not what you want, women can't love a man that they don't respect. And so it's a great topic. And so a lot of times I would have these properties I'd make offers on and I would follow up with them a week or two before I kind of knew that the realtor would be getting ready to probably drop the price a little bit. And the deal that I would do with them is, hey, if we're able to get this deal done before the price drop actually goes through and you put it through on MLS, I'll give you both sides of the commission. Because typically in real estate, the listing broker and the selling broker split the real estate commission. And since I was a buyer looking to flip the property, either keep it for myself or flip it to another investor, I was still going to make money on flipping the property to them. And the realtor loved that because then they could go to the seller and say, hey, I got one of my investor guys and they would negotiate on my behalf to get the seller to sell at terms that I wanted. They'd make more money. The bank got the property unloaded off their books because at the end of the day, banks are in the money lending business. They're not in the property owning business. And it, it's really satisfying when you follow up with something for a year, year and a half like that when in the business world, and then you get them at just the right moment when they're ready to change the terms or give you a better deal. So let's look at, so obviously what happened was Trump and Paul Ryan, who's the Speaker of the House, put together a deal, and even though they have the majority in the Senate and the House of Representatives and the presidency, they were unable to get to, I think it was like 215, 216 yes votes to support the bill. Because he had Republicans in his own party that just wanted to, no matter what, they wanted a flat out repeal of the bill. They don't like people getting health insurance for free because they look at it as an entitlement. And obviously you got the Democrats who, you've heard the bleeding heart liberal term before, they want to take care of everybody, which is a nice thing to do, but often the numbers just don't fucking work because at the end of the day, somebody's going to have to pay. The money's going to have to come from somewhere. And if you look at the way the Democrats are behaving, they're just anti-everything. And to be fair, the Republicans, when Barack Obama had the majority, were the same way. They're like, well, we're just going to vote no just to be obstructionists and just to go the other way. And then us as the people, we get pissed off because nothing ever gets done for us. It's, it's like what John McCain called it several years ago. It's an uncivil brawl for power is what essentially goes on in our Congress and parliaments around the world. you got everybody jockeying for position, trying to get what they want. And so if we look at, listen to some of the things that Trump said, is that with the health insurance premium skyrocketing, you got many states, I think there's five states where there's only one insurance carrier willing to provide Obamacare. And in the next year, those states, those last insurance companies are going to be pulling out and just say, we're not going to provide Obamacare. And so you're going to have people that aren't going to be able to get insurance unless they get on Medicaid or something like that. And so right now, the Democrats' attitude is, hey, screw you. They were... If you watch Nancy Pelosi in the news, they're all gloating. It's a victory for us. It's a victory for the people, blah, blah, blah. They're all full of themselves. But at the end of the day, there's a freight train coming down the tracks, and that's that the thing is imploding because the insurance companies just can't make money because young people who are healthy are not buying health insurance. They're just paying the penalty because they're like, what do I want this ridiculous insurance for? 
deductibles are so high, even though you're paying insurance every month, going to the doctor and the basic things that most people use for medication, the deductible is so high, they end up paying it out of pocket. So why people are, have the attitude, if I'm going to have to pay the doctor anyways and pay for my own medication, I'll do that, but why should I be paying for health insurance? It's not going to cover it anyway to take my money and just give it to somebody who's not paying anything and is getting government benefits. And so you got more people that are very sick that are taking money out and they're not paying anything in. And so there's just not enough people who are healthy signing up for it. And so by the end of the year, it's like if you listen to Trump, the campaign, he said, I should just let it implode, but it's not the right thing to do for the American people. And if you look at the Republicans, how they got into office was, hey, we're going to repeal Obamacare, and that's what they promised their constituency, the people, the supporters, the people that voted for them. And dozens of times over, over the last seven years since Obamacare has been instituted, the Republicans, once they got control of the House and the Senate, have been passing bills to repeal Obamacare, and obviously Obama just vetoed them. And so they were saying, hey, we're going to repeal it, we're going to repeal it, and Trump always said, we're going to repeal and replace it was something better. The Democrats won't participate at all, but think about it from this perspective. In 2018, we've got more elections coming up, and so these people on Congress and the Senate are going to be up for re-election, and they got elected and put into office because they were supposed to go and fix Obamacare. That's what they promised their voters. Well, right now it's 2017, so it's really not. We're almost two years away from those elections actually happening and them having to answer for the fact that they didn't do it. So now that they got the House, they got the Senate, and they got the presidency, they didn't actually follow through on their promises. And people that are in the individual market, I know like myself, obviously being a small business owner, I have health insurance through my company and I provide health insurance for my assistant. Everybody else that works for me is an independent contractor. And I know our two policies are right around fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars a month. And it's like, that's fucking ridiculous. I remember a decade ago, 11, 12 years ago, I was paying $130, $140 a month for health insurance. Right now, it's like almost $700 just for me alone. I don't ever fucking use it. I don't get sick. I don't go to the doctor. It's just, it's just another tax is the way I look at it. But, I mean, that fucking sucks. It's outrageous. And you got people that obviously aren't making the money, whether they're a small business owner or maybe they have a lawn service, and so they're in the individual markets, and they just can't afford to get health insurance at all, and they're paying the penalty on top of that, and that penalty is being used to give health care coverage to people who are on welfare, who aren't paying for it, and so obviously as time goes by, Democrats and the Republicans are going, they are going to hear more and more from their constituents when the premiums continue to skyrocket. I mean, I think it was Arizona last year, it was up like 100, 116% or something like that. I mean, that's fucking absurd. And so what Trump has done is he just said, hey, we're on to the next thing. Kind of like if you notice what Bill Belichick says, hey, we're on to Cincinnati. That video that I did last year talking about how he's living in the present moment on focusing on what he can get done. Trump realized he can't get the people in his own party to agree to do something now. And so from a position of leverage, he doesn't really have them in a position where they're willing to make the deal that he needs to make. Because as he said, it's not fair to the people that have insurance now that didn't have it before, just say tough shit and let people die in the street. He wants to be middle of the road. So he's got Republicans in his own party that just want to repeal it. And unless it's just straight out repealed, they're not going along for the ride. But they promised the people that put him in office that they were going to fix it. And now the, they basically, in essence, broken their promises because Trump ain't coming up for re-election until another four years down the road. So as time continues to go by and the insurance premiums continue to go through the roof, and as the rest of the insurance companies just start pulling out of Obamacare altogether, you're going to have all these people that are mandated that they have to buy coverage and there's no policies available for them. So what do you think is going to happen? As time goes by on a monthly basis, they're going to be getting more and more phone calls from their constituents bitching and complaining about the fact that they're not doing anything. So the heat, it's like the, the pot of warm water. The heat is just slowly getting turned up. 
And so, like, right now, the Democrats are, fuck you, we're not going to participate at all. And the Republicans are like, and his own party are like, fuck you, we're not going to approve this. He's like, screw it, we're going to go on to tax reform. And what was interesting, if you've been paying attention to the news, because I, that's what I, I do a lot of my spare time, is, is reading and listening to what's going on around in the world. If you listen to, like I saw, what was his name, Rand Paul, He's talking like, yeah, we're going to come up with a new bill. And, and then there was another guy who was one of the members of the Freedom Caucus, and they were the ones that basically gave Trump the hairy middle finger and said, no, we're going to vote no on this. Same thing with him. He's talking about, yeah, we'll, we'll start over. We'll put together a new bill and we'll start working on it. And Trump's walked away. Remember, the strongest negotiating position is being able to walk away and mean it. From a position of leverage, he doesn't come up for election, re-election for another four years in essence, three and a half years, if you will. So he's got more time that he can wait versus the Democrats and even the Republicans and the Freedom Caucus. I mean, a lot of them are coming up for re-election in 2018. So over the next 12 months or so, he's gonna, he's, his attitude, you know, these guys like Rand Paul and the Freedom Caucus members are saying, hey, you know, we're going to continue working on this bill. He's like, no, we're on to tax reform now. We're on to Cincinnati, if you will. We're on to tax reform. He's not interested in continuing to work on health care right now. Now, why is that? Because he can't get the deal he wants. He's not going to beg them for a deal. He knows he can wait it out. And just like he said on the news and he's been saying for the past year and a half, we'll just let it completely implode. And when things get so fucking bad and the voters are so fucking mad and pissed off and everybody in Congress and the House and the Senate are worried about their jobs until they're really fearful that they're going to lose their jobs and not get reelected. He doesn't really have a lot from a position of leverage. He doesn't have it. So now he can just simply wait them out and let them continue to field the phone calls and deal with the angry constituents. And he can work on tax reform and continue focusing on his agenda. So if you've read The Art of the Deal, I mean, these it's no surprise at all that he's behaving this way. This is simple negotiation 101, but yet people in the media are trying to paint it as, oh, this is a huge loss. Order. Obviously, he's disappointed. He said he was disappointed. He didn't get the deal he wanted. Now he's just going to wait everybody out because there's a train coming down the tracks and everybody's standing on the tracks picking their ass, thinking they got plenty of time. But as that train gets closer, they're going to start sweating more. And then the Democrats and the Republicans are going to come to them and say, we really need to fix this now. And when they get to that point, then they're going to be more flexible. Then they're going to be willing to do something about it. It's like I talk about when you walk away from a woman who's trying to friend zone you or says she needs space. You move on with your life. You're like, I'm not waiting around on you. I'm not going to beg you to be in a relationship with me. I'm not going to beg you to date me. I'm not going to beg you to treat me the way I want and deserve to be treated. If you're not going to do that, I'm just going to go find a better deal for myself. I'm comfortable being alone until I get what I want. And as time goes by and she doesn't hear from you and she hears through the grapevine that you're out, you're living your life and as if nothing ever happened, then when she reaches out to you, that's when she's more willing to go along with what you want. You, in essence, are calling her bluff. And the only way she's ever going to come back is if there's some amount of interest. I mean, I had a client a few years ago that had a woman that walked away from him seven years prior. And he was dating somebody else at the time, but it really felt good for him because he was able to walk away at that time. But like literally after seven years, because she went through several bad relationships, and then she wanted to get in touch and rekindle things. And he's like, no. Sometimes it's six months. Sometimes it's a few weeks. Sometimes it's just a matter of a few days. That's why it's so important in life to know what you want, to know why you want it, and to not be willing to settle. Because at the end of the day, if you settle, like I remember when I went to work for Syntex Rooney in the 90s, I really wanted to go work for that company because I wanted to work on a Disney project. I wanted to move to Orlando. And so the VP who was negotiating for my, I actually took a small, a less of a salary than I was making for the contractor down in Fort Lauderdale. And the way I justified it to myself, well, the cost of living in Orlando was cheaper than it was in Fort Lauderdale if I'd have stayed down there. 
but I didn't want to take the chance on him hiring somebody else because then I would have still been stuck down in Fort Lauderdale. So he had the leverage on me. And at the end of the day, we he and I talked about this. He says, well, I wouldn't want you to take the job if you're going to be upset or pissed off. And he says, this is what I just budgeted. And he was just negotiating with me. If I, you know, if I'd have been more experienced, I was like 25 at the time, 24, 25 at the time. Obviously, knowing what I know now and what I've learned and obviously much older being 47, I would have said, I really want to come work for you. But 37000 a year when I'm making forty a year, it's like, I, re- I really like the opportunity, but, you know, if you can't make it, you can't make it. If it's not in your budget, it's not in your budget. i got a great job here. I'll just stay here, and I've got three other interviews with three other companies up in Orlando. Somebody's going to give me what I want if I don't. If I don't get it, then it's just obviously the timing's not right. But, hey, you know, if you can't find anybody, you know, I'm willing to come work for you at, at least equal to what I'm making now. And he would have respected that. And he probably would have walked away, and maybe a week or so later, he would have called me up and said, "All right, I'll give you the four. And I would, and I, and if I'd have known then what I know now, I said, "Well, I got an offer for forty-five for a contractor up in Orlando." He was like, "Well, who is that?" I was like, "Well, I'm not going to say. I actually have two of them that are willing to give me that. So if you're willing to give me forty-five, then I'll definitely come work for you." And that's how I would have handled it, at knowing then what I know now. But that's that's how you live and learn. And so if you're watching this, you can learn from these things. So back to what Trump is doing. It's going to be inter- interesting to see what he does going forward because unless he gets the deal he wants, he's going to walk away from it. And again, if you listen to the people in the media and the pundits, they don't get that. They don't see that because they're focused on things that really don't matter. So if you'd like to get my help personally, the quickest way is to go to my website, click the products tab at the top of your screen, and book whatever kind of coaching option that you would like. And I will talk to you soon.